We were a top secret classified Department of Defense mission. So to this day, if I told you what we carried, you could never leave this hangar. Uh, so go ahead. I don't want to be. <laughs> One of the fascinating things about it was that my crew and I got briefed into what our capabilities in space are uh, in, terms of, in terms of the military. And again, it's not weaponry. We don't put weapons in space, so it's not weaponry. Uh, after we had gone to orbit and on the first day, we deployed a major new intelligence satellite for the United States, and that's about as much as I'm allowed to say about it, even to this day. This was 1988. So what's that, 34 years ago? There were several real big thrills that we got after we came back. You know, one of the big thrills was coming back alive, of course. Of course. But then there were several thrills awaiting us. And this was December of 88. And so it was either late January or early February of 89. We went back to Washington, D.C. And we went to two places. We went to the Pentagon. And my small crew and I, five of us all together, all military, uh, two Navy and three Air Force, went to the Pentagon to debrief the Joint Chiefs. And this was a little bit intimidating because I'm, I'm just a Navy commander. And on my crew, I had, I had three, three bird colonels on my crew. And by the time we landed, there were, there were four bird colonels because the, the other Navy guy got promoted to the rank of captain in the Navy, which is a colonel in the Air Force. But we went to the small, it's a very small conference room that the Joint Chiefs have. And there's a, there's a big table in the middle of the room. And if you're not at least four stars, you sit on the chairs back by the wall, against the wall, which isn't very far away from the table because it's this tiny little place. Well, I insisted that each of my crew members get to do part of the debrief. And so we stood up and we told our story. We talked about what the mission was like. We had a movie that I don't have a copy of because the movie was top secret. Okay. And James Bond stuff. The movie, the way the movie got from, uh, we landed at Edwards Air Force Base, but the way the movie got delivered anywhere was handcuffed to a courier. It was in a briefcase, a locked briefcase, and it was handcuffed to his wrist. And so that's how that movie would get to where it was going, because, again, it was top secret. So we showed them our movie. Uh, we answered all their questions, and then at the end of it, a moment that I won't ever forget, none of us will ever forget, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Crow, stood up and said, okay, are there any more questions? There weren't any more questions. And he said, okay, gentlemen, I think we owe these young men a standing ovation. And they all stood up and applauded us. Wow. Gives me chill bumps even to think about it to this day. Uh, the, other, the other neat thing that we got to do was we went to CIA headquarters. Now, they awarded us a medal, but they also pointed out to us that anytime you talk about this medal, you are to make sure that you mention that this was not a CIA mission. It was not. It was a Department of Defense mission. It was a DOD mission. But the CIA has this cool medal that, that we had never heard of before, and it was called the Intelligence Achievement Medal. And it's very rarely awarded. And they pinned it on to my entire crew, five of us, and the two lead flight directors for NASA were also awarded the Intelligence Achievement Medal. And... So I tell my wife, um, I have achieved intelligence because I got the Intelligence Achievement Medal. And she said, that's not what it means. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask if I could borrow yours and take it home and show it to my wife and yes, so, see if I could run a number. So there. she said, it doesn't mean that you have achieved intelligence by any means. But then leaving, and we're walking to the door, and there's a security guard standing at the door, and he's holding his hand out. And I said, well, what do you need? And he said, I've got to have that medal back, sir. 
And Mike Mullane, who was my, uh, my lead payload officer on the fight, one of the funniest guys I've ever known, he gets a big grin on his face and he says, wait a minute, you don't mean to say you just awarded us a medal that we can only wear in a safe, do you? And the guard says, well, yes, unfortunately, that's true. And not only that, but you can't tell anyone you were here and that you were awarded this medal. But anytime you're in the D.C. area, come on back and we'll let you in and you can look at your medal. Well, that, that persisted for about five and a half years. And then at that point, we had flown the final classified flight on the shuttle. And DOD declassified all of the medals and declassified the write-up that came along with it. So from, from that point on, I'm allowed to say whatever's in the, the citation that went along with the medal. And what it said between mine and Mike Mullane, my lead payload officer, who, who operated the RMS that grabbed the satellite to lift it out, and that was secret, you know, that that was done, but not anymore. And so the fact that we use the remote arm to lift this satellite out of the cargo bay, deployed it, we separated away from it, and then there was a problem with it, and we had to do an unplanned re-rendezvous with it and help fix it, and then we separated, separated away from it, and it went on to a completely successful career. And to this day, that's, that's all I'm allowed to say about what we did. That was pretty fascinating. That was a pretty fascinating mission. Okay. So your Intelligence Achievement Medal is still in Washington? No. We, oh, I'm sorry. I left that part out. We were allowed. They gave us our medals, and they gave us the citation. So I have both of those. So, uh, and I'm allowed to show those now, and I'm allowed to talk about it. But for five and a half years, we couldn't tell anyone that we had received a medal at CIA headquarters. It, was there a cover story? What did you tell people? What did NASA tell people you were launching the space shuttle for? They just didn't say. They just NASA would just say, and any of the public affairs folks would just say that we were we were carrying out a mission in support of the Department of Defense. So, for example, we were not allowed to say when we got back for five and a half years. I was not allowed to say. Yes, we launched a satellite, but if you had gone out at the sunrise or the sunset and you watched the bright dot of the shuttle going by, you would see another bright dot 80 miles away from it uh, on the same orbit with it. So it was obvious to the world that, sure, we had dropped something off, and, but nevertheless, we, we could not say, yes, we deployed, we deployed something. We deployed a satellite, but now... It was, it's as much as I've described that we're allowed to say, but no more. If you had to think back across your five shuttle missions and some cosmic hand said, sorry, you can only have one. You can only keep one in your memory bank. You can only, there can only be one. Which, which of the missions comes to your mind? Well, second place would be STS-27 uh, because it was the most challenging um, other than the mirror docking. The mirror docking would have to be the one that I would say, yes, I want to, I want to preserve that memory because it was, it was the first docking a space shuttle had ever done. So we were breaking new ground when, when we did that. Now, we had flown the space shuttle up to orbit many times and rendezvoused with satellites and grappled satellites with the robot arm and repaired satellites and brought satellites back to Earth, but we had never docked to a space station until I docked Atlantis with the Russian space station in 1995. And beyond that, though, the, the training leading up to it, the fact that we went to Russia twice to train uh, for a total altogether of about, I think, 21 days uh, was how many days that we spent in Russia training. That was the, the most memorable flight. And what did the Russian part of your training consist of? What were you doing for 21 days? We, we went over there in September of 94, and that was the longer one of the two. I think we were gone for about 10 days. 
So we were at Star City, Zvezny Gorodok, in Russian, Zvezny Gorodok, uh, training on the Soyuz, which is the little capsule that they fly up and down in. But the majority of it was training in the Mir Station simulators. Now, they call it a simulator. We would call it a mock-up. Be- wow. Because it wasn't like our simulators where we have computers connected to all the switches and we can operate the thing and learn which, which controls to activate, actually fly it with the control stick and all of that. What they do, it's more of a plywood mock-up. Now, it's, it's fairly high fidelity looking in terms of what you will see inside the Mir space station. But it isn't like you can run simulations of missions the way we do. You could go in the mirror mock-ups and go through procedures and have your checklist and have some of the equipment and things that you'd use. But you're not going to be flipping switches and turning on the cabin. Well, I suppose you could turn on the cabin lights, but you're not going to be entering things into the computer or any of that kind of thing. So it's, it's more of a training on mock-ups uh, is what it is. At some point in time, somebody designed and built the mirror, and at some point in time, somebody designed and built the shuttle, and then sometime later, somebody said, we're going to dock these things in space. How how do you retrofit to do something like that? The Russians had intended for their space shuttle, which sure does look like a carbon copy of our shuttle, Uh, although, you know, what they will tell you is they'll tell you, Yet, it was designed for the same sort of mission, so of course it's going to look very similar. Well, I have to give them credit for saying, why should we reinvent the wheel? Uh, They already knew what kind of a shape would fly, what kind of a shape would fly a re-entry, and our flight procedures handbooks and our systems diagrams and things like that were never classified. So they could get a hold of it. They could, they could get a hold of how our flight control system operated for reentry. So they don't have to develop that. They can just copy it. And the shuttle, their shuttle, was supposed to go to, the, to their space station. So they had built a docking port on a module called Crystal, and it had, it had about a four-foot diameter ring. Uh, that that their shuttle was going to go fly and dock with. And when they built their shuttles, I think they built five of them intending to send them to space. They were built with that docking module in the cargo bay because we saw saw one of their shuttles in Moscow where uh, where the shuttles were built. We saw one of their shuttles in, in the high bay, and it had the docking port in it. So what we, NASA, did when we arranged to, to fly our space shuttles and dock with their space station, we bought the portion of the docking ring, the four-foot diameter ring, and then adapted it to a structure, and then adapted it to the Space Lab tunnel, and we carried as well the space lab because we wanted to do uh, medical investigations of them in space, of the uh, three cosmonauts who had been up there for four months. When we got there, we wanted to evaluate their, their blood pressure, their heart rate, all their, I guess their blood makeup and all of those things. And so we used the space lab to do that. So we bought that portion of the docking ring to adapt to the space shuttle Atlantis. And that thing, to some people, I suppose it would look like the ultimate Rube Goldberg. But if you looked at it and you had it explained to you by the designer and the builder, who was their gifted builder, um, Vladimir Siromyatnikov, actually showed it to us in Moscow. Now, he was quite old. He was quite old then, but... He showed us how this thing worked, and it had, it had passive dampers, it had uh, uh, active dampers. It, it was a Swiss watch is what it was. it was. It was virtually all mechanical, and we probably would have built something that used a lot of software and might have been more difficult to integrate and all of that. 
but it really worked beautifully because you had you had to be able to account for let's say i hit them a little bit a couple degrees off then it's got to be able to tolerate this kind of thing and so the docking ring itself would get extended on how many struts was it six struts and those struts had as i mentioned passive damping and electrical damping as well and you had to be able to damp all that out and then once you had damped out those motions then you would retract the docking ring down into the rest of it there were if i remember right 12 big stru structural hooks that reached around and grabbed and pulled those things tightly together and if you think about it there's a lot of force trying to push those things apart sure we stayed at sea level pressure in the vehicle 14.7 psi so you've got 14.7 pounds per square inch times about a four foot diameter area trying to push those things apart so structurally those things had to be pretty strong they also had to be pretty strong because now you've got a quarter million pound mirror space station and a quarter million pound space shuttle fastened to it and what's taking all those loads that docking system. That docking system's taken all of those loads. And we couldn't both be controlling the vehicle attitude. So what we did is we took turns. I think we took the first two and a half days that we were there. And then the Russians took the remainder of the time, the other two and a half days. And so initially we were controlling the orientation of the mated vehicle. Um, for, for the first two and a half days. Now, we used thrusters to do it. And then after it was their turn to take over, the mirror took over, and they controlled our attitude and our orientation for two and a half days. They used momentum wheels, which are like big flywheels. And by spinning, speeding up or slowing down a flywheel, you can exert a torque. And so that's how they controlled the attitude of the mirror space station. Um, at the time of the mirror... Uh assignment you were chief astronaut didn't really want to give yourself that assignment and it came down from on high that you indeed needed to command this it was sort of taken out of your hands that they wanted you to command it is that because of piloting skills what are the piloting skills involved in mating up like that for the first time well there are there were a lot of piloting skills associated with doing it because rendezvous and docking in the space shuttle is controlled manually by the commander. So we would do some burns leading up to the, the actual join up. Um, and, and a number of those burns happened at great distances away and it was phasing on the vehicle that you're, that you're going to be docking with. And what, the way we would do it is we would let the Mir space station overfly Cape Canaveral, overfly our launch pad, basically. And then when it was about 2,000 miles out in front of us, which, uh, let's see, how long would that take? 2,000 miles out in front of us would be like uh, four minutes for it to go 2,000 miles. So you're, Are you Mach 25 at that point? We're, yeah. It is. It is. Yeah. Um, but then what we did is we launched behind it and we launched into a lower orbit. So we're going a shorter distance around the earth because we're in a smaller orbit to catch up to the mirror, which was up at 212 nautical miles. And so we would do a series of burns. I think we did something like 13 different burns to phase on it. And, and then we did a terminal intercept burn. It was called TI, terminal intercept. It sounds awful. It sounds like this is going to be a terminal collision. But, but it was targeting to basically hit it. And then uh, at some miles, we, and we would do mid-course correction burns uh, as, we were, as we were closing on it. And then I'd say it was about a mile or two miles away. I took manual control of the orbiter because I'm going to fly it the rest of the way in. And I used a thruster controller, and I could use the uh, control stick, although we can put it in a, uh, an attitude where it'll track what I'm heading for. It'll point at it. And then, and then once we get, we, we flew underneath the Mir space station and stopped, and then flew up the rest of the way from about 1,000 feet below all the way up into the docking. Now, they said, Hoot, you can be sloppy. 
you just have to line the centers of those docking rings up within three inches. So we're both going 17,500 miles an hour, but I have to line it up the centers within three inches or else we'll bounce off. We won't capture uh, the docking ring, we'll bounce off. So, and the contact velocity, the closure rate, was to be one-tenth of a foot per second. One-tenth of a foot per second. Okay, let's see, what's that? That's 1.2 inches per second is the closure rate. So that's about this fast. And by the way, Hood, if you hit it at two-tenths of a foot per second, you will destroy it. So no pressure. But the day before launch, the head of NASA, the administrator, was on a telephone communication with us, telecon. And at the very end of it, he said, okay, all right, I guess we're about done here. And he said, okay, Hoot, one more thing. No pressure, but there are going to be five billion people watching you on television when you do this docking. Because uh, there were. We had live was, was television. Was Golden the administrator then? Dan Golden was yeah. the administrator then. So, yeah, we made sure that we had downlink television able to go to the ground so they could watch it. And so my whole family was in mission control in the viewing gallery uh, and got to watch the whole thing and heard everybody in mission control cheering and yelling when we actually docked. This is Mission Control Houston. As the shuttle Atlantis and the Mir space station pass across the southern tip of South America, our first views of the shuttle as taken from the Mir and relayed to the United Atlantis, States. Houston. This picture now from the Mir space station showing the approach of the two uh, docking mechanisms toward each other. Atlantis 10 feet from the Mir, time to docking, 1 minute 50 seconds. Houston Atlantis, we have capture. Copy, capture. Mechanical systems officer here reports that the two uh, docking mechanisms are now aligned. The docking ring on Atlantis should be uh, retracted shortly. Once fully retracted, uh, the structural mating of the hooks and latches on both sides of the docking interfaces will be uh, underway. Congratulations, Space Shuttle Atlantis, Space Station Mir. After 20 years, our spacecraft are docked in orbit again. Our new era of space exploration has begun. Houston Atlantis, we agree. Uh, it's a great feeling to be here. Uh, it's a, a massive team effort. Many people have pulled together to make this happen. Uh, we're lucky and we're honored and privileged to be part of this. Uh, it's great to be back joined in orbit again. Hear you loud and clear. Well, the real reason I think that, that I got picked was not piloting skill. Well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it had something to do with it because uh, I, I did have a fairly decent reputation as a pilot, um, as a pilot. within NASA. And, but there was more to the story than that. It turns out we had to look back 20 years. I didn't find this out until well after the fact. I think, in fact, I didn't hear about this until after I had, after I had retired from the Navy and left NASA. But it turned out that 20 years earlier, in the Apollo-Soyuz docking, where, where an Apollo capsule launched and rendezvoused with the Russian Soyuz in 1975, July of 75, at the height of the Cold War, and docked together, and Americans and Russians shook hands in space. It turns out that they did two dockings, and I suspect one of them was flown by the mission commander, Tom Stafford, and the other one, the other one I know, was flown by Deke Slayton, so those two flew the two dockings. I don't know who flew which one, but probably the one docking that rammed them so hard that it nearly broke the docking mechanism was probably flown by Deke Slayton because that was his first trip to space and his only trip to space. And Tom Stafford, on the other hand, had been to space two or three times 
and he probably flew the final docking. Well, the Russians never forgot that we had hit them kind of hard. And now 20 years later, here we come with our quarter million pound space shuttle to attack their space station. And so what I was told was the Russians were nervous. The Russians were quite nervous about this. And to help calm them down some, NASA wanted to be able to say, look, this is so important to us, we're sending our chief astronaut to command the mission. Sure. And I guess I can see the logic in that. But it was not what I had intended. It wasn't what I had planned on, because as a leader, you are not there to skim off the good deals for yourself. And this was a huge mission. It was a hugely cool mission, a really big challenge, but a really satisfying thing to get to do. I wasn't about to give that to myself, because as the chief astronaut, I picked who flew the missions. And it got taken out of my hands. And so I wound up having to do it. And in hindsight, it was a thrill. It was a real big thrill. How did, again, just little basic things, how did you know we're, we're down and locked, we can go ahead and open hatches, we're, we're coupled as we should be? We had, we had feedback. We had a, we had a software program uh, on the shuttle that I think we had powered up through a laptop computer. So we, we, we had learned how to do that fairly early in the shuttle program. It was really challenging and difficult and expensive to make changes to the mainframe computers on the shuttle because you make some little change in it, now you've got to run it through all the verification steps to, to verify that it's safe to do. But we found out that we could bring laptop computers on board. We could plug it in and have it talk to the onboard computers. Now, we had to, we had to verify that there was nothing that we were going to do that was going to alter anything that was in the mainframe computers. But we could pull data out of them. We could, we could, um, we could look at things like we, uh, the rendezvous program was really helpful because it could say, okay, here's where we are right now because the shuttle knew. The shuttle knew how far away you are, what your closure rate was, all of those things. We could look at it on a laptop computer, and it could say, okay, if you don't do anything different than where you are right now, if you don't fire any thrusters, here's where you'll be in 30 seconds, here's where you'll be in a minute, here's where you'll be in two minutes to be able to look ahead and predict was so valuable for being able to fly the rendezvous. So we had a laptop computer that could look at all the micro switches and things that were in the, uh, the docking mechanism. And so we knew when we had all the structural hooks engaged and that they had pulled everything tightly together. So, so we were able to tell that. So that was what let us know that, okay, all right, we've got them joined. Now, the next thing we had to do, though, was we had to repressurize the Mir space station. Air is a very valuable commodity up there in orbit. I would bet. <clears throat> one, one of your most valuable commodities, in <laughs> fact. And they were down to 12 PSI, 12 pounds per square inch of pressure. And, of course, we stay right at sea level pressure, 14.7. So we had to give them a whole bunch of air. Now, fortunately, we have lots of air because we carry liquid hydrogen uh, doers about four foot diameter is how big these doers are, full of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. So we manufacture the atmosphere on board the shuttle, 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. So we opened up the differential pressure. There's two of them in the hatch. We opened up the differential pressure um, taps and open it up to where we could dump air into the mirror. So it took us, I want to say, it took us about a half an hour to flow air through these orifices over into the Mir space station. Well, the Mir space station was big, and so we had to repressurize them to sea level pressure before we could open the hatch. Did, did we foresee this? Did we oh, know we knew we about gonna, it. Yes, we, we knew, knew we were going to have to do it. 